we're dead. Come on in. These words greeted law enforcement on the morning of Jan January 5th, 1932, in a br after a brief shootout in Houston, Texas. This incident was the culmination of a three-day nationwide manhunt for the Young brothers, Harry and Jennings Young, and had started in a little community of Brookline, Missouri, just outside of my hometown of Springfield. On January 2nd, 1932, just three days earlier, the Greene County Sheriff had taken a 10-man posse out to the Young family farm to arrest Harry and Jennings. On, they were on, uh, Harry was under suspicion of murder of the city marshal of the nearby town of Republic. And what happened next was the Young brothers did not come quietly. And after a gun battle, six of the 10-man posse were killed. I learned, of, this became known as the Young Brother Massacre. And I learned about this when I was 10 years old from a family friend, uh, and his name was Bill White. And it was a very personal story for him because of that 10-man posse, seven of them were members of the Springfield Police Department. One of them was supposed to be his dad. And I say supposed to be because his dad was going out to back up the sheriff in the arrest, and at the last second, he had an errand that he had to just step out for a minute, and another officer said, well, don't worry about it, I'll go for you. And that officer was killed in the ensuing gunfight. And Mr. White's dad was always deeply aware that someone had sacrificed himself for him. It was a fact that this was so deeply felt by him that he passed it on to his son, and his son even passed it on to me. Uh, Mr. White, his son, Mr., uh, Mr. White Jr., is still living. He's 96 years old, and I had the opportunity to speak with him last year. And, and again, we talked a little bit about this, about his father bringing him and his brother to the funeral home after they had brought the bodies in. But he was, Mr. White Sr. was always very aware that instead of the first car where he would have been dead, he was in the second car where they found the bodies. And he had this very sense of, it should have been me. Now, most of us here have never had anyone sacrifice themselves in a gunfight. But as Christians, we all should feel that same sense of reverence because we are exactly in this same situation. We can all say it should have been me because when we stand before God, our sins should have condemned us to death. But we had somebody who stepped in and sacrificed himself for us, Jesus. And then like the shootout in 1932 where this officer unwittingly sacrificed himself. He didn't get up that day and know he was going to die. Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew what was coming. He knew what that meant if he came to earth for us. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, it says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And likewise, Paul would write in Galatians, Paul, who knew what it was like to have someone die in his place, wrote in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, in the flesh I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And this is how we're supposed to see ourselves. Having someone else die for you changes you, and it should. And as we come today to remember his sacrifice, we need to remember this, not just today, but every day. And as we pause to remember here the sacrifice, each day as we go out, we should, re we should live with the death of Christ running through our lives. And we should always remember that we shouldn't use the term living as though someone died for us because someone did. Christ did die for us. So as we examine ourselves this morning and commune together, we have to ask ourselves if we are living with the awareness of Christ dying in our place. And if we aren't, then we need to make, it, make the changes. It's both that simple and that hard. It should have been us, but Jesus took our place. Shall we pray? Dearly Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for all the blessings of life that you've given us, but today we come especially thanking you for your son Jesus, who willingly came to earth, willingly allowed his blood to be shed for us so that we could have the hope of eternal life with you. And as we take this bread, which represents his body, help us to put aside the distractions of life, help us to uh, truly remember, truly concentrate, and truly be thankful that he gave his life for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Shall we pray? Dearly Father, we come again uh, remembering the death of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross that uh, he was willing to come and shed his blood, which this fruit of the vine represents. And we, again, praise you that there was a plan in place to come and help us in order that we could have life with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.